So we finished up in the last section talking about the causes of imperialism. And we had finished with the reasons why imperialism in Africa in particular was able to be successful. You know, the combination of European advantages, European ideologies, and then some of the characteristics within Africa and the African kingdoms itself that enabled Europeans to come in and take over and dominate. So what we want to begin with this time is the meeting where all of this is actually laid out and solidified. There is an actual meeting that begins the division of Africa, the imperial takeover of Africa, and it's called the Berlin Conference. Um, so since it's called the Berlin Conference, clearly that means it's taking place in Germany in the capital city in Berlin. And you can see down here in this picture at the bottom that you've got a bunch of European leaders seated around a table with a map of Africa up here on the wall. And this is, in fact, the way that this meeting took place. Um, leaders from all over Europe, 14 nations, sit down and decide as a group how they are going to go about the, the economic and political takeover of this continent. Now, you've got to remember, just for some context, Europeans have already done this once in the Western Hemisphere. They had sailed west, beginning with Columbus, and then followed by Magellan and Cortez and all kinds of others, and they'd already done this. They'd already gone, they'd colonized, they'd extracted resources, they'd enslaved populations, um, and then they lost control of most of that Western Hemisphere because of all those independence movements that we've just recently been learning about, the revolutions in you know, the British colonies in North America, followed by the revolution in Haiti, and then you know South America and Mexico. And so now the Europeans are really kind of desperate. They need, in their minds, access to raw materials again. Um, you know, they're in the midst of this industrial revolution. Their economy is booming. They need cheap resources. And so they look to Africa as a place to exploit. Now, at this Berlin conference, um, so as not to engage in unnecessary conflict with each other, they establish some basic rules, uh, some ways in which they're going to about th in ways, some ways in which they're going to go about doing this. Uh, and it's pretty simple and straightforward. Rule number one is, whatever area you get to first as a European nation, whether you're Britain or France or Germany or Belgium or whomever, um, you have to notify the other European nations. The hope here is that you're going to be able to avoid overlap, you're going to be able to avoid different countries fighting with each other for the same space, um, you know, like kids do with wanting the same toy. We're trying to avoid that because instead of just two kids fighting over the same toy here, you would have countries with armies, and that would get pretty messy. But the second rule is a little interesting. Um, it's not enough to just claim that you're taking a place you have to be able to show that you can control it, that you have the military power, that you have the political power, that you have the economic might, uh, whatever you want to call it, to be able to control this area that you are claiming. Um, and again, it it needs to be prefaced that this is a hor horrible way to talk about one group of people treating another. Um, the fact that you can have these representatives from 14 nations casually sitting around a huge conference table, eating and drinking and um, you know, circling places on a map saying mine. It, it, it's just, it's incredible to think that this actually happened. Um, but it did, and you can see the outcome below, that Africa gets divided up. Uh, if you look at the colored map at the bottom, uh, this gives you some idea of the end result of this meeting. That, you know, some of the more powerful countries in Europe, France and England, for example, gain huge sections of Africa. Um, some of the not quite so powerful countries, Germany, Portugal, Spain, get considerably less, but in each case, each of these countries is intent upon gaining access to as many resources as possible. So they're very strategic in terms of what they take, and again, remembering that they have to control whatever they claim. They're trying to be careful not to bite off too much more than they can chew. Uh, it's also worth noting, just in terms of the color that you see on the screen, it seems like France might be the clear early winner, um, and they certainly gain a lot of land, but it's important to remember what this section of Africa contains, the Sahara Desert. So a lot of France's you know, valuable territories are actually going to be the coastal sections of what they get control of. Um, the middle makes it look impressive, but 
maybe not as beneficial as they would think. And they knew the Sahara is there, so it's not like they got duped on this. Um, but when you look at Great Britain, when you look at England, the territories that they claim, um, you've got some small coastal areas, mostly centered along rivers, and that's going to be important because of the ability to move quickly you know, by water, uh, to get resources out, to bring new supplies in, um, and then especially their control of the Nile River beginning in Egypt, and then also South Africa. Now, South Africa and Egypt both are going to be uh, kind of unique situations. In fact, anytime Europeans go to any of these countries, there's always going to be a story about how this unfolds. And we obviously can't tell all of them, but we're going to talk specifically about Egypt and South Africa. Now, the other thing you might notice here is that one of the sections, well, two of the sections on this map are actually labeled independent, meaning they're not taken over by the Europeans. There's a small section over here, which will be the Kingdom of Liberia, and this much larger one here on the east side of Africa, and this is Ethiopia. And we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that, too, and why Ethiopia in particular is able to remain unconquered by Europeans. Um, but the net effect of all of this is that Africa is divided up based on what it can offer to Europeans, not based on who's there or what they believe in or what they look like or who they like or who they don't like. Um, these are very arbitrary boundaries, and so consequently you're dividing some cultures that had been living together or nearby for centuries. And in other cases, you're drawing lines around two conflicting groups or multiple groups that had conflicts with each other and now forcing them to live essentially under the same roof. And the Europeans didn't really care about that. They cared about the resources. Um, they're not really interested in you know, African religions and cultures or whether these are compatible with each other or with the Europeans that are now coming in to control them. Uh, again, the focus really is on resources, on wealth, and on power. And the general thought seemed to be, if we can do it, then we're going to do it. And we'll figure the rest out later. That's obviously going to cause some problems as things progress. And you can see a little bit of that European mentality here. Uh, this is a short quote from Henry Stanley, a uh, European explorer, one of the people that goes into Africa um, in an attempt to bring European culture, European way of life, European thinking um, into the continent. And you can see in this comment here, uh, again, this, this European mindset of how they see Africa. Um, and he goes on to say that as yet the Congo Basin, so that central part of Africa, is a blank, a fruitless waste, desolate and unproductive. In other words, no good thing is there. And then he says, it's been our purpose, the Europeans, to fill this blank with life, to redeem the waste, to plant and sow that the dark man may gather. In other words, we're doing you a favor. Um, we're bringing into this unproductive and desolate area life, good things, and you should thank us because now you actually have something worthwhile in your country. Um, we're going to vivify, you know, make vibrant the wide, wild land so long forgotten by Europe. In other words, you know, we're almost apologizing here that we haven't done this sooner because you've been forced to live in such, you know, horrible squalor and you know, non-European settings. Uh, but then he says something interesting. He says, but cursed be he or they who, animated by causeless jealousy and a spirit of mischief, will compel us to fire our station, destroy our work so conspicuously begun, and abandon Africa to its pristine helplessness and savagery. He's essentially cautioning Africans to not rebel, to not resist this. In other words, we're doing you a favor, and you better appreciate it, but if you're jealous, or if you're mischievous, or if you try to resist us, fine. We'll destroy everything we've brought in. Um, you know, essentially, we'll take you back to the Stone Age, because that's where we think we found you, and we'll abandon you to your helplessness, because that's how Europeans see them. That everybody on this continent is uniformly helpless. And thank goodness that the Europeans are coming to your rescue. Again, it's important to understand the mentality that's motivating some of this. Now, we had mentioned earlier that Ethiopia is one of only two places in all of Africa to resist European takeover. And the way that they do that is really kind of interesting. Um, you see here, 
the man in this picture. Uh, his name is Menelik II. He's the emperor of Ethiopia. Um, you know, his family has been ruling Ethiopia for years. Um, Ethiopia has been its own self-sustaining kingdom for centuries. Uh, a long, long history and tradition and culture. And they don't particularly want to be taken over. And so what Menelik is able to do is actually take advantage of these European rivalries, take advantage of the fact that he, there are multiple European countries that want access to his land. And the short version is that through some pretty impressive diplomacy, he's able to play the Italians and the French and the Russians off of each other. You know, make a deal with one, you know, asking for support, for weapons, for supplies, so that he can resist the others. And if hopefully he wins, then he would negotiate a happy deal, let's say, with the Italians. And if he loses, then the Italians haven't really lost a whole lot by, you know, just giving him a few supplies. And then he works the same deal with the other countries. You know, France, if you help me out, uh, we'll try to fight off the Italians and the Russians. And if all goes well, France will make a good deal with you. And if we lose, well, you haven't really lost much. And then does the same with the Russians. And nobody really realizes what he's doing until Menelik has built a modern European army with modern European weapons. Um, and you can see here in the picture at the bottom, there is a battle that eventually takes place. The Italians figure out that they've kind of been duped here. They've been tricked, and so the Italians are on the right side. You can see the flag. They've got their officers, their modern rifles, their cannons, uh, you know, their artillery down here. But then you look at the other side, and you see the Ethiopian army, and there's Menelik. And all of his soldiers have rifles. And all of his soldiers have rifles. And there's a lot more of the Ethiopians than there are the Italians. Because that's what happens when you invade somebody's country. It's hard to bring enough people. And they even have their own cannons and their own machine guns down here. And you look at the battlefield here in the middle, and it's not going well for the Italians. Um, the Ethiopians are definitely winning. This poor guy is not doing so well. This poor guy is really not doing well. Um, and after this battle, it becomes apparent to the European powers that Ethiopia is just going to be too much work to take over. That it got too strong, that Menelik did too good a job of taking advantage of you know, these overly ambitious European countries, and that the Europeans are better off looking elsewhere. And so Ethiopia, Ethiopia becomes one of the few success stories in this age of imperialism of resisting uh, European invasions. Now this also means, you know, pros and cons with everything, this also means that Ethiopia will not receive a lot of the industrial technology that Europeans bring into the places that they conquer. Uh, they're not going to get railroads, they're not going to get factories, they're not going to get those things that Europeans bring with them when they take over a country in order to more quickly and efficiently ex extract its resources. Um, and so you'll see shadows of that affecting Ethiopia today. Um, <coughs> this document up here is a great example of the way that the Europeans tried to gain control, not only of Ethiopia, but throughout places in Africa. In most cases, they did it without bringing their army in first. They tried to do it through diplomacy, they tried to do it through negotiation, um, and to be honest, a fair amount of trickery too. Um, and so as you look at this document, you can see that um, you know, this is something that the British government used in multiple areas, mostly along the Niger River, and the idea was to get the chiefs of whatever tribe or kingdom to sign off on it, agreeing legally that they were giving up their country uh, forever. <laughs> which is quite a commitment, uh, and however much space that country or kingdom extended into. Um, they pledge not to go to war without asking for permission, so they're really setting themselves into this lower position. Um, and the Europeans promise not to interfere with native laws or customs, uh, which is a great promise to put on paper, but we're going to find it doesn't really work out that way. And in return for giving up control of their kingdom, you know, these chiefs, these rulers, these kings would be given compensation of some sort. And 
unfortunately in most cases those forms were signed without a great deal of understanding of what was being signed. Um, contracts and legal documents were not something that was necessarily common in some African kingdoms. Uh, word of mouth, you know, a verbal promise was more than sufficient in a lot of cases and people held you to your word. And so the idea of legally binding contracts, you know, written on a piece of paper, wasn't something that was a part of some of these cultures. and So there were definitely cases where people were signing things that they didn't understand, and then furthermore didn't understand when the Europeans rolled in with armies or things like that and now took possession of something that the African rulers never realized had been handed over. Now again, Ethiopia is one of the few places to resist that takeover. Um, as you saw on the previous page, all the rest of Africa gets divided up. And so one of the other places that we want to take a look at is a powerful African kingdom that does not fare as well as Ethiopia did. And this is going to be the Zulus. Um, now the Zulus were an incredibly large and very strong African kingdom, um, kind of in the center in the south of Africa. And prior to the Europeans showing up, the Zulus dominated most of that region of the continent. Um, and they really hit their peak under the leadership of a man named Shaka. Uh, and Shaka had some pretty revolutionary ideas about Zulu weaponry and fighting tactics. Um, you know, it's nothing on the scale of the European invention of the machine gun, but he revolutionized the way that the Zulus fought with what they had available to them. Um, you know, he innovates this much longer spear, you know, taller than a warrior and a full body size shield. So this is almost essentially what you saw with the Romans and the phalanx, right? If you line up all your soldiers side by side and they can totally cover themselves with a shield and they have you know, a far reaching weapon that can either be thrust or thrown, you can do a lot of damage on a battlefield if the people that you're fighting against have something less than that. The problem for the Zulus is when the Europeans show up, they have guns. Um, they have rifles they have cannons, and they have these early machine guns. And spears and shields just do not match up well. If you have a second, click up here on the video link. Uh, this comes from a Hollywood rendition of this battle between the British and the Zulus. It comes from a movie called Zulu, and it gives you a great picture into the battle that the Europeans have. It's definitely from the European standpoint, so all the drama, all the fear is on the European side. Are we going to win? Are these, you know, quote-unquote savages going to run us off? Um, but it's also a great example of European technology in the hands of a few people being able to overcome and dominate large numbers of local people. And so in the end, unlike the Ethiopians, the Zulus are defeated, they're conquered, and the British will come to dominate South Africa. Now, the British experience in South Africa is going to be a little bit different than it was against the Zulus, uh, largely because in South Africa, the British are going to be fighting against other Europeans. Now, you may remember going back to the age of exploration, uh, the first European explorer to get around the bottom of South Africa on his way to India. Um, was Portuguese, Vasco da Gama, and before him Bartolomeu Diaz, the Portuguese explorer that had discovered the Cape of Good Hope. And, um, so there had actually been some European settlements, first by the Portuguese, then later by other European countries in that bottom part of South Africa. And the largest population down there was actually from the Netherlands, Dutch people. And so these Dutch settlers went to South Africa and colonized, much like you know, the pilgrims came to you know, North America or the Spanish went to Central and South America and, and set up shop. That became their new home. And so over time, these Dutch settlers stopped thinking of themselves as being Dutch, and they start thinking of themselves as being South Africans. Um, they called themselves Boers, which was a Dutch word that meant farmer, um, you know, settler. You know, that same idea that you see in the United States um, during that same period of colonization. And so these Dutch Boers um, who had come to South Africa in the 1600s have been there now for a couple hundred years. This is their home. This is where they live. This is how they think of themselves. And 
as they've been down there, you know, the African slave trade had been going on, the Boers had enslaved um, the native South Africans. They hadn't engaged in the slave trade, but slavery in South Africa was just as brutal as those slaves that were being sent from Africa to the Western Hemisphere. And this was the life that the Boers had carved out for themselves. Into this, then, from the Berlin Conference, this scramble for Africa, as we call it, um, the British decide that they can claim South Africa and they don't have to recognize the Boers, that the Boers have been in South Africa so long that they're really not necessarily Europeans anymore, or at least that's the rationale. You know, kind of in the same way that the Peninsulares uh, viewed the Creoles in Latin America, that you know, you've been living in this land too long, you really don't count as full-blooded Europeans. And so the British try to make this a political statement. They're going to fight the Boers over this issue of slavery because we've now reached the point in world history where slavery has begun to be outlawed. Um, you know, the United States has fought its civil war north against south over this issue of slavery in the 1860s. And so this Boer War that's taking place now in the 1880s and into the early 1900s, um, you can make this a trendy war by saying, oh, we're fighting against slavery. These horrible Boers are, you know, they're just, they're awful people. They're enslaving the South Africans. We're, we're fighting to give everybody freedom, right? It's a great way to pitch this. Um, but it also helps, again, that the British have much more modern technology. And so there's, there's going to be two Boer Wars. Um, in the first one, the British fairly easily defeat the Boers. And you can see the Boers here on the left side. You know, they look like you know, settlers, farmers, a little bit of cowboy, maybe. Uh, and you can see the British over here. This is obviously more modern day, but, you know, the traditional British redcoats have been a thing for a while now. Um, so this formal military against this sort of informal militia, and the British win. And because the Boers have lost, they now have to leave this conquered area that the British now control. And so what happens is something called the Great Trek that the Boers who had been living down here in South Africa are forced to pack up their stuff and leave, migrate essentially, north and a little bit east, up into this region that was known as the Transvaal. And the Boers make a new home for themselves there. So the British are in the south, the Boers are in the Transvaal, and it seems like everything should sort of settle down. Except for this, the Boers in their new home discover gold. Uh, discover some of the largest gold deposits in the world, um, diamonds for that matter too. Uh, but it was the gold that caused the issue, uh, because now the British feel like, okay, maybe we need to fight a second war. You know, the first one was over slavery, but the second one's going to be about money, because why should these Boers get to have all this gold when we could take it? And so in the second Boer War, uh, the Boers learn a lot from their first conflict, and consequently, they fight much differently. Um, they use a lot of guerrilla warfare tactics, uh, sabotage, setting traps and ambushes, um, you know, fighting and then running away and then appearing someplace else. And this is also, unfortunately, what we can consider the first modern total war. Total war meaning anything goes. Um, so in this second Boer War, you see civilians getting targeted by the British. Um, they actually kidnap um, and hold hostage you know, the women and children of the Boer fighters. Um, you actually see, unfortunately, kind of the, the introduction to what will become more famous in World War II, the concentration camp, that they build these, you know, outdoor prisons, essentially, to hold these Boers hostage to try to make the men stop fighting. Um, a lot of some of the prominent World War II leaders, uh, Winston Churchill, for example, will fight in the Boer Wars, and that's going to be their introduction to um, 20th century warfare. So again, when all is said and done, the British gain control of South Africa, uh, the Boers are defeated, and this British Empire is steadily increasing in size. Now, the other place we want to talk about is Egypt, and we had mentioned before on one of the earlier pages that this too becomes controlled by the British. And the reason why, if you remember back from the previous video, we had talked about that term geopolitics, the strategic importance of a place that maybe doesn't seem all that important. And the Suez Canal 
was something that the Egyptian people had actually tried to create on their own. You see there's this small piece of land that separates Egypt from the Sinai Peninsula. And if it weren't for this small piece of land, you could take a ship from the Mediterranean Sea down into the Red Sea. And if we do it on the larger map, through the Mediterranean Sea, down through the Red Sea, and you're in the Indian Ocean in no time. Now, because of that piece of land, though, if you want to get over to India from Europe, you can't go this way. You have to go all the way around Africa. So this little tiny piece of land, the Suez Canal, became incredibly strategically important. Now, the Egyptian government had actually tried to dig this canal themselves. And you see in this picture here, uh, they've got workers lined up with shovels. You know, some, some modern equipment, you know, steam drills and things like that. But for the most part, this was a hand-dug ditch for miles. And unfortunately, the Egyptian government went bankrupt before it was completed. And so at this point, the British stepped in and said, we'll save your government financially but we get control of the canal. And unfortunately, the Egyptian government didn't really have much of a choice in this. And so the British finish up construction, they open the canal, and now the best part for the British is that anybody who wants to come through this little stretch has to pay. Uh, just like a toll booth on the highway, if you want to let somebody go through you know, a much more efficient path or you know, travel at a higher speed or whatever, you gotta pay. And so in this case, the British are able to make incredible amounts of money for controlling this little tiny piece of land, or in this case, this little tiny strip of water that they had created. And you can see just how dramatic a difference this makes, um, even in modern travel terms, um, so ocean-going vessels and things like that. If you want to make this trip from Europe around Africa to India, it's a voyage of 20 days. If you go from Europe through the Mediterranean, through the Suez Canal, you can make that trip in 13 hours. So you can imagine the, the thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars of a difference that that makes for businesses that are trying to engage in global trade. And if you control that one little tiny piece of land, you can make a lot of money. This picture here gives you some idea of size. This is a, a normal, you know, power boat that you'd see on the ocean or on a lake or something like that. This is an aircraft carrier which you can see is taking up most of the space in the Suez Canal. So this is not a huge body of water but it's enough to let ships pass and make that trip um, from the Atlantic Ocean to the Indian Ocean a whole lot faster. Now if you want a good wrap up for this period of imperialism click on this star up here. There's a good crash course video that'll take you through a lot of the ins and outs of it. Um, but just to kind of close the loop on imperialism in Africa, there's positives and negatives, as with most things. Um, you know, one of the positives is that Africa gets European technology brought to their land, you know, in many cases against their will, but, you know, they're modernized in a way that they may not have been able to do on their own or may not have been able to do as quickly. So you could argue that that's a positive effect of you know, this European takeover. Obviously not so positive as the way the Europeans viewed the Africans that they were now beginning to control politically, economically, and certainly ideologically. Um, sadly, there's a lot of forced labor, slave labor. Even though the slave trade has now ended, uh, that does not stop the Europeans necessarily from forcing Africans to work for next to nothing because of the way the boundaries were drawn. Again, Europeans were able to take advantage of African rivalries to, to pit one group against another, and in so doing, better control both. Because if you're focused on your own enemy, you don't focus so much on the Europeans. Um, the Europeans do bring in modern medicine and better food, which is gonna result in huge population growth in Africa. Um, and that's going to be hard to decide whether or not that's a positive or a negative. Um, you know, more people is usually good for a society, but a society that doesn't have the resources to take care of more people, you know, a larger population can actually create problems. And that's going to be some of what different African countries will face. You know, as the Europeans are extracting most of the resources for themselves, that leaves the African governments to take care of their own people with a whole lot less. Um, and you'll see today that overpopulation 
or rising populations without the necessary food or medicine or access to clean water uh, is still a daily struggle for many people in those countries. And all of that, or a lot of that at least, you can trace back to this age of European imperialism. Now we're going to stop here, and the next segment will be about what happens when the Europeans go to India.